Coming up. Shocker. Facebook suppresses conservative news. The king of beers will now be known as America, because why not? What is healthy food? The FDA is still trying to figure out. The debate of the Klingon language heats up. It's official. We're not alone as NASA discovers 12,000 new planets. 12,000? That's 1,200. 1200. <laughs> you're you're going to learn really quick not to give me these numbers like this. <laughs> oh, what's old is new again as more websites are going for ugly and functional. Don't fight the system. Farm cartoonist loses his job after 21 years and over 1,000 published cartoons. I got that number right, right? <laughs> <laughs> and really, how much does a bee sting on the penis hurt? Quite a lot. That and more on this episode of Watts. <laughs> this cake is kicking it. I'm telling you now, son, you better keep her. You got my blessings right now to marry. Woo! You left me out for my feet, baby. Woo! Go on, girl. Go! On. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us once again. This is the Wide Open Talk Show for Wednesday, May the 11th, 2016. And luckily, I can think on my feet because I did not change the welcome text whatsoever from Monday's show. <laughs> anyway, I'm Donovan Ed Kissin, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host and good friend, Sam Lewis. Hey, Sam, how's it going today? It's going great, Donovan. It's other than me apparently sucking at ever reading numbers i'm, I'm perfectly fine <laughs> oh you know it's okay i mean tyler and i were actually talking about how he was trying to do some math in the shower last night and and just some of the most basic things you know I, i've got an excuse i'm 46 years old so it's it's very uh, expected that I can't divide fractions. I mean, I've always hated math. I can't stand fractions. <laughs> I like to convert all my fractions to decimals. But like he pointed out, there are certain times when you, you know, that just doesn't work out. Um, take one third, for instance. You know, if you need yeah. one third of something, you know what that is. But if you convert it to a decimal, it's point three 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 on infinium. So mm. Anyway, well, this is a call-in show, and that number is 229-518-3525, 229-518-3525. Oh, just checking the board, making sure I had everything potted up the way it was supposed to be. Not pot as in smoking type, but you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. This is getting off to a start. already. I mean, we had some technical difficulties to begin with. I was trying a new thing in the background, uh, trying to use something else to actually do the encoding. And all of my tests this morning actually proved that it worked out better. And then, of course, when it got to be showtime, it was like, ha, ha, no. Yeah, I can't ship you any of my sonic screwdrivers that quick. So <laughs> I, I really <laughs> needed it, it that way. Yeah, 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 I really need it. All right, so I guess let's start off today by talking about Facebook. Mm. And the fact that they might not be quite as neutral as we're led to believe. I mean, they're not Fox News, fair and balanced, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Dripping Fox. with sarcasm on that one, yeah. aren't we? <laughs> Fox News, not only aren't they, they are not fair, they're sure as hell not balanced anyway. <laughs> uh, so Facebook, you know, you've got this thing on the right-hand side of Facebook called trending. And I think it's only been in existence for a couple of years now, but uh, Gizmodo actually has an article that talks about how uh, conservative news in that trending section has routinely been suppressed. Mm. And they're getting their information uh, from some of the former news curators, if you will. These are actual contractors that um, their responsibility was to sit there and and actually kind of monitor what is in the trending section, as well as, apparently, they would inject stories that uh, they, they had some level of autonomy. Let's put it that way. 
Mm. But what it comes out to uh, reveal here is that um, it was kind of subjective. It, it wound up being subjective. Like this one person said, uh, this one former curator said, depending on who was on shift, things would be blacklisted or trending. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, the former curator is uh, politically conservative, one of a very small handful of curators with such views on the trending team. Quote, I'd come on shift and I'd discover that CPAC or Mitt Romney or Glenn Beck or popular conservative topics would be trending because either the the uh, wouldn't be trending because either the curator didn't recognize the news topic or it was like they had a bias against Ted Cruz. Mm. Well, I can't fault them there. I kind of have a bias against Ted Cruz myself, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, ugh. Well, he is the Zodiac killer, so. <laughs> he, he looks it, honestly. <laughs> I mean, that's our opinion. Don't sue us. <laughs> Just going with an internet meme, that's all. <laughs> oh, that's, that's right. That's right. So um, the article goes on to say that other former curators interviewed by Gizmodo denied consciously suppressing conservative news, and they were unable to determine if left-wing news topics or sources were similarly suppressed. The conservative curator described the omissions as a function of his colleagues' judgments. There's no evidence that Facebook management mandated or was even aware of any political bias at work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the article is, is is sort of lengthy. I mean, it goes on to really detailing, like, another section here. Um, one of the other, one of the former curators said, quote, We were told that if we saw something, a new story that was on the front page of these 10 sites like CNN, the New York Times, BBC, then we could inject the topic. If it looked like it had enough news sites covering the story, we would inject it, even if it wasn't naturally trending. Mm. And uh, another little thing that they t- they uh, talked about was the fact that they they essentially had a mandate not to inject stories or promote stories or however that it was supposed because it's still an algorithm that is supposed to actually come up and do these things, but they could yep. inject these stories. They were told if it deals with Facebook, make sure it's not trending. You know, don't do anything mm-hmm. with it. Uh, or they had to bump it up the chain. You know, they had to ask their manager. And then a lot of times their manager would actually go to his his or her manager before it would actually uh, get the okay to, act, to be injected in the trending stories. This is why, no, really, Facebook is about to go paid unless you post this in your profile. Never really hit the trending thing. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had I had a friend that fell for that the other day, and I just I didn't even bother to tell him. I just Steel? kind of, uh, yeah, I I kind of just shook my head and went, ah, oh, okay, fine. Wow, <laughs> I mean that's that's about as ignorant and and old as Bill Gates is going to start paying everybody for emails that they send or some crap. I mean, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh boy. So the uh, the time span that these curators worked for Facebook was from mid-2014 to December of 2015. And uh, initially, well, I don't think think Facebook actually ever got back to Gizmodo. They reached out to Gizmodo, but they never actually, I mean, uh, they reached out to Facebook, but Facebook Mm -hmm. never actually got back to Gizmodo. But they do have a couple of updates here. Now, this this article was published, when was it published? Uh, Monday, okay? This past Monday, which was the 9th. So they've got an update that said that several hours after this report was published, Gizmodo editors started seeing it as a topic in Facebook's trending section. Gizmodo's video was posted under the topic, but the top posts were links to redstate.com and the Faith and Freedom Coalition. A little bit dubious, the fact that it's an article from Gizmodo, but yet it's mm-hmm. not listed in the in the top posts. Right. Uh, then at 4.10 p.m. that afternoon, a, face, a Facebook spokesperson issued the following statement to outlets including Bu- uh, BuzzFeed and TechCrunch, but they did not respond to Gizmodo's repeated request for comment. And this is what they said. Quote, we take allegations of bias very seriously. 
Facebook is a platform for people and perspectives from across the political spectrum. Trending Topics shows you the popular topics and hashtags that are being talked about on Facebook. There are rigorous guidelines in place for the review team to ensure consistency and neutrality. These guidelines do not permit the suppression of political perspectives, nor do they permit the prioritization of one viewpoint over another or one news outlet over another. These guidelines do not prohibit any news outlets from appearing in trending topics. Well, that sounds kind of to the point, but then May 10th, which was yesterday uh, at 8.50 a.m., there was a statement posted by the vice president of search at Facebook, Tom Stocky. Um, actually, it was posted late the previous night, but they did the update at uh, 8.50 a.m. May 10th. Yeah. I'm not going to read his because it, it goes, it's it's rather lengthy. You, you know, yeah. you'll find the link in the show notes and go there and, and read it. But basically, Facebook is coming out saying, no, none of this is true. <laughs> Um, or not anymore. They, they, yeah. They're pretty much saying that, no, we've made changes since these people worked here, and there's, you know, things like that. So, Yeah, that's a very good point. I hadn't thought about it that way. It's like, well, it could have been true from mid-2014 to December of 2015, but it's no longer true. Mm. I'm. Do you use the trending section at all in Facebook? Do you ever see I, anything there that you're like, oh, that's interesting? I sometimes glance at it. I mean, it requires me to go to Facebook on a regular basis, which I usually don't. Um, so it's that's that's part of it. Uh, but but normally I am using the mobile version of it just as a glance because I can quickly glance, get back, and continue on with my day. Right. So as a result, I do not think unless I'm just completely. He says as he's opening it up just to make sure because. <laughs> And it's easy to do because the iPod's right there. No, it doesn't have the trending thing actually on the interface of the mobile setup. So, no, I don't use it most because mostly I use it mobile. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, my wife, whenever she got her smartphone, let's see, she's had her smartphone now. She's got an S5, so she's had it since 2014. Yeah, we got... We got them, I think, around October, November, somewhere there in 2014. And one of the things that she pointed out was that she would never put Facebook on her phone. Now, she's got Twitter, mm -hmm. but and, and she's got uh, Pinterest. She's got Instagram, but she absolutely refuses to put Facebook on her phone. And I don't know if I really understand that logic. But, okay, that's that's fine. I mean, I actually went through, I actually went through an entire month, December of 2014, where I did not get on Facebook at all. Mm. I removed it off my phone, and I actually logged out of Facebook and did not, ha did not have a tab open at all. And it was just a trial. I, I tried it. 30 days. I wanted to see how how my life would be without Facebook for 30 days. And honestly, it was great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it, it, was, it was great. But unfortunately, because of the type of work, work that, that we do, you and I do, I mean, we're content creators, and mm -hmm. to get the word out and, and to get the most publicity that we can to let people know about what it is that we're creating – we need to use all of the social media uh, services out there to the best of our ability. And unfortunately, whether we like it or not, face, Facebook is the biggest. Mm, yeah, totally. So I, I do find that I use the – I've started more here lately noticing things in the trending section uh, that will catch my eye, and then I'll click on it, and then, of course, I'll go over – I'll go over to that page, and, and then, you know, on, on my main page, it just gives me a little subsection about Yay Big. And, and, and for, for audio listeners, I'm holding up the fingers of about, I don't know, is that six inches? Anyway, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it only gives me probably about six or seven. And then when you click on trending topics, 
it goes over to whichever one that you actually are watching or you're you're reading about, then it like full blown gives me about twenty different things, and mm-hmm. and it I believe it's in alphabetical order, so um, I kind of like it. Uh, I've never been one to really view Facebook as you know on one end of the political spectrum or the other. Right. Um, Zuckerberg is a millennial, so <laughs> what do you expect? Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. No no hard feelings, Zuck. I'll take your money if you feel like you want to fund any project that I'm, <laughs> I want to do. I don't mm. care. But um, honestly, I, I, have, I have really felt like that Facebook, if you were to ask me just point blank and say, which way do you think Facebook leans, left or right, or, or are they neutral? I'd say they're left-leaning. It's just a vibe I get. Well, they're in San Francisco, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, most most tech tech companies do to things like that. They they tend to be left leaning. I mean, it's just that's. Wait a that's minute. Are you say are you saying Twitch is left leaning? <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> uh, well, you're probably not wrong, considering that that uh, practically my entire family and and I was pleasantly. Not really surprised, but pleasant, somewhat pleasantly surprised that whenever Devin came and visited us in December, uh, by the way, he works for Twitch, and um, <laughs> you know, found out that he was a Bernie supporter. So my entire family happens to be in, in support of Bernie Sanders, the one true president. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, of course, anything that has to involve truth will never actually be in a political office. So yeah, that's, that's true. That is very true. Whether we like it or not, politics is all about compromise. It's That's one way to put it. <laughs> well, the compromise is you compromise to bend over, and they'll compromise not to shove it in so hard. So Okay, fair enough. Man. There you go. All right, Budweiser, the king of beers. King of beers, Budweiser. Which you will have more experience about this than Mr. Never Drinks at all. <laughs> so... Well, so, yeah, Budweiser, you know, is and I, and I call them that that's their moniker. I don't know if they still use that or not, but for the longest time, I mean, it was Budweiser, the king of beers. Budweiser has forever and a day, as far as I know, been the best selling American beer. And, and I say American in quotes for audio listeners, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. because number one, in 2008, they sold themselves off to a foreign country. So they're not even American owned anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's a company called InBev. And what is more ironic about this is the fact that from May 23rd until the presidential election in November, they have rebranded their beer <laughs> as America. So when you go in and you want to get a six-pack of Budweiser and the person behind the counter goes, we don't sell Budweiser, don't get <laughs> upset. Stop and think. Oh, I want a six pack of America. It just sounds so epic, doesn't it? Give me a six pack of America. Actually, what they should have done, and this is the way Philip was saying it yesterday, but instead of America, they should have put the apostrophe on it and just called it America. America. I want a six pack of America. (laughs) Yeah. But you've got me into him now. Thank you for that. You are welcome. He's he's an acquired taste. You may not mm-hmm. agree with him all the time, but he is. I, I invite anybody to go and and look up Philip De, Philip DeFranco and watch his shows. He's uh, he's a lot, and he's even pointed this out. You know, when he first started out on YouTube, because he's an early YouTuber, two thousand six, two thousand seven. He was an angry young <laughs> white man. You know, like <laughs> if if he disagreed with, burn him, burn him in a fire. <laughs> but now he's more even killed and I mean he'll still call stupid stupid, which right. he should. But uh I, I I'll get even a, do that. So. Yeah. <laughs> I get a lot of good information from him. So um yeah, youtube.com slash sexy feel, S X E Phil. All right. So anyway, um so <laughs> yeah, America. <laughs> Toss well, me that can of America. Yeah, well, that can of America. <laughs> you, you about I want some America light. <laughs> you about can't say a sentence like that without the voice coming through, right? It just, you can't. It doesn't it sound naturally. the same. Can you? 
can you please give me a six pack of America? Thank you. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. I mean, it's got to be rough and tumble. It's like six pack of America. Hoorah! You almost grow the belt buckle just saying it, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> oh. Goodness gracious. Well, a little side note, of course, this is probably uh, not news, new information for a lot of people, but summertime is the biggest uh, time of the year for beer sales. Oh. Go figure. I mean, it's hot. People want to drink. They get <laughs> yeah. out. They barbecue. They grill. They get drunk. They fornicate. They have children. Oh, wait. <laughs> Where was I going with that? Anyway. That's just May. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Um, now, along with, with this, they are going to have phrases from the Pledge of Allegiance and lyrics from the Star Spangled Banner and America the Beautiful on the cans. Hmm. Now, what I'm waiting for whenever I saw <laughs> this, this Pledge of Allegiance, mm-hmm. is the first time that it has indivisible under under god on there mhm if they have the guts if they have the it, well right. if they have the guts to do it i'm going to count you know 5 4 3, three. 2 1 lawsuit <laughs> exactly <laughs> the 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 in oh shoot which one? There's too many organizations that sue people now to where they all get into a blender in my head now. I can't spit them out properly. Oh, I know. Well, just just pick one. It's the, the CDAFGPRQ. I mean, right. whatever. It's what whichever organization it is. I mean, it's... Yeah, and, and all of them are, are squished up versions of letters that actually aren't pronounceable, so you can't remember them that way. It's just... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I <laughs> give me an acronym I can pronounce. <laughs> ACLU, there we go. I had to think. I I seriously had to think what one guy that I sort of shook my head, but at, at a time they had gone through this one big thing, so he used to call the ACLU the Anti-Christian Liberties Union. <laughs> hey, <laughs> so, that's not bad, actually. It was cute. It was pretty cute. I liked it. It was it was a fun joke given the trend of the specific lawsuits they had been doing. If anyone so much as mentioned it, that and if someone was being a jerk, then yeah, go for it. But some of the things they were going against were like, if I had presented them to you, you would have went, "What the heck?" Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, even something like this, because <clears throat> though I may disagree with that line in in the. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance because it was mm-hmm. added in the 50s due to the Red Scare and, and no other reason. Yeah. Totally. Um, you know, Budweiser or Anheuser-Busch, InBev, they're, they're a, a corporation, they're a company. They're not bound by First Amendment rights when it comes to, you know, the proliferation of a, a unified religion or anything like that. That's a governmental thing that can't happen. So if they mm-hmm. wanted to do that, I personally don't have a problem with it. I know there are going to be people out there that are going to go. And if someone were to sue over that, I mean, (laughs) you're going to sue InBev, which is not even an American company because of the fact that they use the line that mentions God from the Pledge of Allegiance. (laughs) You have no basis. You have no grounds. It It does not go against the First Amendment at all. Totally. Now, if the federal government was selling beer... (laughs) (laughs) And I would really worry what was in that beer. But anyway. I, I know. First beer, then marijuana. See? We we have we have come up with these federally endorsed genetically modified hops that get you drunk ten times faster so you don't pay attention to what we're doing over here. That, that's right. That's right. You pay attention to the beer that's in your right hand. Don't pay attention to the dagger that's in the left hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Okay. I I do not drink Budweiser. Uh back whenever I was growing up, I did. Uh because it was I mean it was what you did. I mean Paps Blue. Paps Blue Ribbon is actually still an American beer. I mean it's mm-hmm. as American as Amer- as America can get. Um but Budweiser was always the thing. People drink Bud Light. And mm-hmm. I mean, you know, if you you really wanted to show your sauce, then you drank Budweiser. You know, it's like I'm not drinking light beer. I'm drinking the I want to chew my beer. 
which <laughs> Budweiser and Bud Light can only, I mean, they taste like, and and it's funny when people say this because your next question always has to be, how would you know? Um, but it tastes what you would think urine would taste like. That's what I've heard. Even as someone that ha- doesn't drink, I've heard that comparison before. Yeah. So it's not good. But I always thought that's what beer was supposed to taste like until my good friend Ben Rayberg introduced me to actual what real craft beer was all about. And I can't drink anything but craft beer. Well, let me let me clarify that. When I was drinking, I could drink Ice House because it was bitter and I liked mm. that bitter flavor. But otherwise, uh, it's got to be a craft beer. It's got to be like a, a 90 minute IPA, a 60 minute IPA, something from, you know, companies like Dogfish Head, which people look at you and go, what? what? <laughs> What's the name of that company? Dogfish Head. Don't ask me. I don't know, but they make hellaciously good beer. <laughs> so I can't stand Budweiser. Doesn't mean I can't stand America. Right. I love America, <laughs> just not in a can. <laughs> Okay. All right. So the FDA is going to reevaluate the definition of healthy food, which I I found this rather interesting because, you know, especially during the 90s, we got on this, this craze. And it has come out since then that a lot of this was, was pushed for our own uh, corporate interest, profitability. Yeah, that everybody needed to have a low fat diet, you know, mm-hmm. then every, you know, every company that could, could, you could imagine that could make some type of low fat food just came out of the woodwork. I mean, you had the Atkins diet and you, all this yeah. other kind of, you know, these microwave meals and what have you, low fat, low fat, low fat. And of course it's come out that that's actually not really the case. It's not low fat that you need to be worried about because you're actually harming your body because you're cutting out some of the healthy fats when you do this. Mm -hmm. And healthy fats actually come from like nuts and things like that. Um, And how this came about is there's this company called uh, Kind, which they make a Kind bar. They're they're called Kind Mm -hmm. Healthy Snacks. Now, I've, I've even looked on the back of these before. Oh, I've really? tried a kind bar before. Yeah, and they do, they are not that bad whenever, or at least the one I looked at. Now, they, there's a lot of these snack bars and stuff like that. I have been lately doing some experiments in the field of these snack bars because I'm kind of getting ready for Dragon Con, right? Trying mm-hmm. out some bars, figuring out what I can keep in my pack to go around, stuff like that. Because um, if, if you get some of these granola bars and stuff, if you look at them, you go, my God, this is a candy bar. You know, it's because there's so much sugar in it, it might as well be a freaking candy bar. Um, so you kind of have to read the what's in it and stuff. So it's, I've been doing experiments, but the kind bars have checked out so far. I haven't really dug that deep, but the one that I did grab, pretty good. Yeah, see, I, I'd never heard of them, and I've definitely never tried one. Mm. But they are calling, uh, they're calling their uh, kind bars healthy and tasty. Mm. And so the FDA had had an issue with that. And the reason for that is it says currently if a food company wants to put a healthy claim on its label, rep, uh, reg, excuse me, regulations stipulate that it must be very low in fat and the specific rules are complex. But for instance, a snack food can contain no more than three grams of fat for a regular size serving. So that means that many of the snacks that have nuts in them just don't qualify as being healthy. So they uh, they complained, kind did, to the FDA because mm-hmm. that, um, well, the FDA complained first that kind was saying healthy and tasty and their their bars have nuts in them. Right. And then they pushed back and said, look, you know, you need to review this. And so Daniel Lebetsky, the CEO of Kind Bars, quote, said, uh, we are pleased that the FDA is looking into revising its definition. And the company helped launch a citizen's petition requesting that the F- FDA take uh, action. So the FDA actually looked into it and said, uh, OK, your, your bars can be considered, can 
healthy. Mm. Um, now, the article goes on to say, and this is on NPR, it says, as we've reported, millions of Americans clung to the advice that low fat was best. During the 1990s, an era of fat-free mania, America's, Americans, <laughs> not Americas, Americans were making a habit of munching on sugar-rich, refined grain products, mm -hmm. such as snack wells. And I don't even know what snack wells is because I didn't eat any of that. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I guess you know yeah, what a snack, snack well is. I do know what a snack well is. They were these cookies that were marketed as your, your low-fat, healthier cookie. You know. Oh, okay. They were, you, you got this much fat in a snack well, and you got that much out of a horrible, disgusting, normal cookie, which I tried to snack wells once. They were the disgusting cookie. I'm sorry. They did not taste good at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, well. <laughs> okay. Disgusting cookie. Tell us how you really feel, Sam. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, so anyway, the, it looks like they're going to go through and, and, and start taking comments. Uh, from the public and find out exactly what it is that, uh, why did I go there? Thank you. Mm. <clears throat> anyway, um, so nuts have healthy fats. Uh, this is a quote from, what's this guy's, let's see, Sherman. He Thomas Sherman. He's an associate professor at Georgetown University who teaches medical students about nutrition. Quote, nuts have healthy fats that we know are good for cardiovascular health and mental health and are good sources of protein. He also points out that nuts are calorie dense, so people should limit portion sizes. But he says the, that overall, nuts are a wonderful component of our diet. And that's mm. what she said. Anyway. Oh, uh, you, you, <laughs> mean, you mean? That's what she said. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, so the dietary... Guidelines, which were updated earlier this year, recommend eating foods rich in healthful fats. And I kept having trouble with this word, healthful. I'd never seen the word healthful, H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L. Uh, I just, I, I want to say healthy, healthy fats, or right. help, you know, helpful fats. Healthful? I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure if I've seen that word either. I'm, I'm squinting for anyone that's watching because I've... Just, uh... I can't remember if I've heard the word or not. It seems like it rings a bell, but someone in the background might have rattled it off at some point or something. I don't know. Yeah, so. I'd never heard of it. <clears throat> okay. So we've got a lawsuit. Paramount is suing a crowdfunding, a crowdfunded Star Trek fan film titled uh, Axanar, which I have seen what they've produced so far, and this thing has been top-notch quality as far as I'm concerned. I mean, one of the best, I, I'd say in, it'd be in the top five of, of fan-made fan uh, films or shorts or whatever you want to call it. Now, Paramount and CBS have sued them because of the fact that part of it stems from the fact that Paramount and CBS are launching a new Star Trek series later this year or early next year, which is yeah. only going to be available on the CBS All Access streaming service, which it up until... It apparently ahead. started filming just recently. Oh, cool. So. Um, and I've actually been a subscriber to CBS All Access up until about a month ago, and once this comes back, I'll probably resubscribe, but honestly... For six dollars a month, the quality, <clears throat> the quality of the, I mean, the shows are great. You want to watch NCIS, all the NCIS is Criminal Minds, all of that, it's there, but the quality of the streaming sucks, uh, uh. especially when they go to commercials. I mean, and that's the thing to keep in mind with that particular service for five ninety nine a month, you don't get to ignore the commercials. You'll get you'll get at least four commercials in every forty five minute. Uh, television show that you watch and the mm -hmm. audio is atrocious whenever it <laughs> whenever it switches over to a commercial i think it goes to 56 kilobit mono at <sighs> best and at not even 44 kilohertz we're talking 22 kilohertz it's terrible oh yeah. yeah sounds like it so I, I, that's the reason why i kind of dropped it and i procure my cbs shows 
other ways. But <laughs> um, I pay for them. I pay for cable. Mm. So anyway, there's this lawsuit. And one of the things that I didn't realize was coming out of this <laughs> was dealing with the Klingon language. <laughs> now, of all the things to actually be brought up in this suit, I never would have guessed that it would have been the Klingon language. Right. But, but according to this article, which is on HollywoodReporter.com, it says, so we're going to review. After the Star Trek rights holders filed their complaint, the defendant production company demanded particulars of the franchise's copyrighted elements. So basically, they were like, okay, you want us to stop cease and desist, but what is it in this that you say we're violating your copyright? So in response, Paramount and CBS listed a lot of stuff, but apparently what drew the most attention was they claimed entitlement to the Klingon language. <laughs> CBS and Paramount said, we own the Klingon language. Okay, so the defendant then reaches back to a 19th century Supreme Court opinion for their proposition that the Klingon language is not copyrightable as a useful system. Mm. So I'm going to read this from the article. It says, on April 11th, that drew an entertaining response from the flummoxed plaintiffs. Quote, this argument is absurd since a language is only useful if it can be used to communicate with people, and there are no Klingons with whom to communicate, stated <laughs> a plaintiff's brief authored by David Grossman at Loeb & Loeb. The Klingon language is wholly fictitious, original, and copyrightable, and defendants' incorporation of that language in their works will be part of the court's eventual substantial similarity analysis. Yeah, tongue twisters there. Defendants' use of the Klingon language in their works is simply further evidence of their infringement of plaintiffs' characters since speaking this fictitious language is an aspect of their character. So to break it down, they're basically saying that the defendant's assertion is actually making the case for the plaintiffs. <laughs> now, U.S. District Judge R. Gary Klossner gets a chance to rule on this. But he has been asked by the Language Creation Society for a review from mm -hmm. them as a friend of the court brief. Now, the brief was authored by Mark uh, Randaza, and it begins by noting that the Klingon language was invented in 1984 by Mark Okrand for Star Trek III, The Search for Spot. Now, when I read this, I got to thinking about it, and I was like, you know what? There was no Klingon language prior to Star Trek III. Yeah, I always thought of it more of a um, wharf sort of thing, and going forward from there, I never thought about the classic series Klingons before. Yeah. And that's what they point out is the fact that in the classic series and even in Star Trek 1 and Star Trek 2, well, Star Trek 1 didn't have Klingons. Uh, I don't think Star Trek 2 did either. They they brought the Klingons in in Star Trek 3. Of, of, of all people who actually played a Klingon was uh, um, Doc, <laughs> Doc Brown. Oh, yeah, Christopher Lloyd Christopher played a Klingon, Lloyd. I remember. Yeah. yeah. So they introduced the language in Star Trek 3, the search for Spock. So it was created then. Um, <clears throat> further from the article. Before that, when actors played Klingons in Star Trek television programs or movies, they simply uttered guttural sounds or spoke in English, which was Federation standard. Given that Paramount Pictures commissioned the creation of some of the language, it is understandable that Paramount might feel some sense of ownership over the creation, but feeling ownership and having ownership are not the same thing. The language has taken on a life of its own. Thousands of people began studying it, building upon it, and using it to communicate among themselves. And, of course, they've got a... Um, I've got it up on screen for our, our video viewers, but and, of course, the link to this will be in the show notes. But they've got, they've got a thing here where it says the shortcomings 
of the Hollywood Reporter's font system precludes quoting some of the more entertaining <laughs> moments of this brief read in full below. But here's a look at how Paramount is being blasted as arrogant and pathetic in Klingon. <laughs> yeah. So we've got over 250,000 copies of a Klingon dictionary that have been sold. The Klingon language certification programs are now being offered. Microsoft search engine Bing even presents English to Klingon translations. We've had one Swedish couple perform their marriage vows in Klingon. We've had foreign governments provide official statements in Klingon. <laughs> so the Language Creation Society is holding up Klingon as having freed the, quote, bounds of its textual chains. So ultimately, the amicus brief comes back to the theory that Klingon is just not copyrightable. Um, the society asks, quote, what is a language other than a procedure processor system of communication? What is a language's vocabulary but a collection of words? The vocabulary and grammar rules of language provide instructions for a speaker to articulate thoughts and ideas. One cannot disregard grammatical rules and still be intelligible. And creating one's own vocabulary only worked well for the bard. Vocabulary hmm. and grammar are no more protectable than the bookkeeping system in Baker versus Sheldon, 101 U.S. 99 of 1879. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that the judge sees reason on this. I mean... Hmm. Whenever I started reading about this, it made me think of the of the Dothraki language that was created for Game of Thrones. Mm. You know, that thing is actually grown from what it the the guy who originally created the language. Let's see, uh, who created the Dothraki language? Uh, David J. Peterson, along with George R. R. Martin. Mm. So my question is, you know, would this be considered a copyrightable language? Because if people get, and people have, they've taken this language, they've added to it. I mean, people role play and they speak in this language, just like they role, role play for Klingons and speak in Klingon. Yeah. So uh, what do you think? I mean, does Paramount and CBS have a leg to stand on or do, or do you hope the judge makes the, the right call on this? I'm I'm kind of hoping the judge makes the right call on this because it's it's sort of something that even though it was originally created, it's almost gone out of the bounds of what it originally was. It's it's a thing that the fans hold. It's their system, things like that. So, I mean, heck, when you can have a college course of which college courses exist for you to learn Klingon, then I think it's I think it's gone way past the this is our copyrightable work anymore. Yeah. So, 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 what am I really saying? I'm saying this lawsuit is without honor, is what I'm saying. So, <laughs> yeah, I love the way it ends. It says, uh, it says, according to the amicus brief, which also nods to the framers of the U.S. Constitution and to Sesame Street theme song lyrics, no court has ever addressed the issue of whether a constructed spoken language is entitled to copyright protection. Whether or not the Star Trek fan film case provides the very opportunity is now up to the judge. He could sidestep the legal geekery by agreeing that Paramount, uh, with Paramount that defendants and those interested are making too much of this, that use of Klingon is merely evidence of some larger infringement, or he could give Klingon speakers everywhere, kapla! <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I'm hoping he does, because this lawsuit is stupid. Mm. You know, this to me, this is yet another case of companies where... You know, and it's kind of like what we touched on with Let's Plays. It's like companies that decide, oh, oh, well, we're not going to let you record our games and put them on YouTube. And, oh, my goodness, you know, give us more exposure because you're making a little bit of money. And we're not making anything off of what you're doing other than the fact that you've just given us free advertising. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <Turned out>. uh, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> So, and I feel the same way about Paramount. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. We do not want you to proliferate the Klingon language because, let's see, whenever you think of Klingon, what do you connect that with? I don't know. Worf, Star Trek, Captain Picard, uh, the entire franchise. 
free advertising. Oh, no, no, no. If you want to use it, what, I mean, what's next? We can license you the Klingon language? <laughs> you can kiss my ass is what you can do. <laughs> <laughs> Let me find a translation. How do you translate that into Klingon? <laughs> oh. I'm sure it has a somewhere in it. <clears throat> yeah, let me see. Um, translate. Kiss my ass into. You're actually going to do it. <laughs> Klingon. I want to know. I want to know. I, I guess I'm going to have to go to Bing. Thank you for failing me, Google. Hmm. Let's see. Kiss. Dun, dun. Well, I guess that's radio silence. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to look that up. Yeah. Translate. Well, it wants to do it to Latin. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! Here it is. Really? That's that's kind of lackluster. Kiss my ass in English. Clan. <laughs> Translates to S kiss in Klingon. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Moving on. <clears throat> so now we've got more than 1,200 new planets that have been discovered through NASA's Kepler Space Telescope. So, hey, guess, hey, we're not alone. <laughs> we're not alone. They probably, all of these habitable, potentially habitable planets probably have their own Donald Trumps that they're having to deal with. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Oh, anyway, so the Kepler found 1,284 candidates that have a 99% chance of being a planet, and that's out of 4,302 potential planets that were detected by the telescope. Now, for those that aren't familiar, and I wasn't entirely sure how this thing worked either, but it's not like they can see the planet. It's, it's dealing with, it's, it's, <laughs> it's watching the light, mm. and whenever it dims, they're making a presumption that something's going in front of it, and it's got to do it, I think, like three times before they actually consider it a uh, potential or something like that. Uh, yeah, because there's junk out there and stuff. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, here it is. It says, Kepler detects planets by noticing the tiny dimming of light when a planet passes in front of its star, as the sun did on Monday when Mercury made its rare transit across its face. But these signals could also be caused by any manner of objects moving through space, creating false positives and a great deal of caution among scientists. So, yeah, these planets, it takes about 15 years of hard work for astronomers to find and confirm about 2,000 transient planets that have been found from the ground. So, these new planets were found in only a small patch of the night sky between the constella constellations of Lyra and Cygnus. I do not know where Lyra and Cygnus is. Not a clue. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're actually launching, I think, another... Yeah, future missions will significantly add to NASA's data. The agency has several new telescopes slated for launch in the coming decade, including one called TESS, T-E-S-S, -S, which will examine closer stars than Kepler, and another that will be able to detect the atmospheres of exoplanets. Signs of oxygen and water vapor in those atmospheres would point NASA toward the discovery of, quote, truly living worlds. So that's neat if you're kind of, you know, geeking into space and what have you. Sweet. All right. Uh, this is one I came across this morning. Um, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> for, our, for our video uh, watchers here, you'll you'll see this, but... This is, uh, it's kind of a, it's a trend called brutalism, which I had never heard of. And, and apparently, brutalism, the original brutalism, actually harkens back to the uh, 70s style architectural movement that was characterized by large buildings with exposed concrete construction. So we had this guy, creative director at the, and I'm not even going to pronounce that, uh, mm -hmm. It's in Zurich, Switzerland. He founded the site brutalistwebsites.com, and it's um, it was meant as a place to showcase websites that he thought fit the brutalist aesthetic. 
which is mm-hmm. uh, design marked by a ruggedness and lack of concern to look comfortable or easy uh, in reaction by a younger generation to the lightness, optimism, and frivolity of today's web design. <laughs> Basically, think back to 1990s era, 1995, 96, 97, and that all the way up until the early 2000s web design. And that's what this is. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> He notates this one site. Uh, there's one called trulybald.com. And I mean, goodness gracious. <laughs> it's, uh, man, the, 19, the 1990s are calling and they want their websites back. <laughs> but what I found funny about this is okay, so maybe it's a movement, but, mm. and here's another one called tilde.town. Uh, you know, this is this site says tilde.town. It's a small Unix server made for file sh- for for sharing. Um, they're functional. They may not be pretty, mm-hmm. but they're functional. Yeah. And I have to admit <clears throat> that I have found over the last couple of years. I don't know about you, but. Surfing the web, even with these faster connections that we have now, surfing the web has just gotten to be a chore. <laughs> uh, when I want to go and and read an article, the amount of the number of times when I'm reading an article, and I read fairly fast, so I'm starting to read the article, and the page is still loading. So I'm scrolling, and I've gotten past like paragraph one, paragraph two. Suddenly, another graphical element's got to come in, some freaking <laughs> advertisement or something, which then yeah. will make the thing jump up or jump down. So then I got to find my place again. I start reading again. Another element pops in. That irritates me to no end. So I really, really, really enjoy websites. Well, even like Medium, which is what this article is, is, uh, uh, was published on. Mm. There's no advertising here. Yeah. That I can tell. I mean, I'm running ad blocker, but ad blocker's not blocking anything. Right. And and as as I've said before, if it's a site that I frequent and I enjoy the content, I don't want to block the ads because I want to make sure that the site owners and the content creators can continue to ke- to create good content. And if that means that I've got to put up with a few ads for them to make a few dollars, I'm fine with that. What I'm not fine with is when I've got videos that autoplay <laughs> or I'm yeah. scrolling through and suddenly there wasn't a video there, but it goes whoosh, and now there is a video and it will start autoplaying. It'll it'll be muted, but it'll start autoplaying. That aggravates the crap out of me. Yeah. I'm going to block you. I am <laughs> going to use ad block. I will consume your content and I will b- block all your freaking ads because you're being a complete moron. So I really like light sites that I can get to the meat of the content. Mm. Um, I I do like a good looking website, but it's got to load fast, and and all of your elements in that site has not it, it can't be detracting and and it takes me out of what it is that I'm 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 trying to learn I'm trying to read about. Mm. Yeah, I'm currently dealing with that sort of thing on my own website on the TSCN side of that. I've been thinking about a redesign for a while, but I don't want to make it too complex, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I've got to figure out how to make it net navigation wise better and look better, but don't overload it. There's there's a fine balance that you that you have to strike for something like that. So that's the reason why I actually went with a podcast-centric theme for Slant.fm. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's not not cheap, it, but it's definitely worth the money. I, th- I think it's like fifty or sixty bucks. But mm. uh, that's cheap compared to some of them. Oh out yeah, there. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Uh, there there are some out there that are a few hundred, hundred dollars, mm. uh, if not more. But it's completely designed for podcasts, and um, I, I use it a little bit differently than it was designed, but it still works. So uh, that type of design really doesn't work if you've got a site that's a combination of articles and podcasts. You got to you you typically have to do something else. But 
but anyway, th- this was this was almost like a, a walk down memory lane for me because, you know, I've I've been around. I mean, I was in my early twenties when the internet went commercial, mm. so I was there when it happened, and yep. uh, you know, from the from the dial up days down here in South Georgia, we the the prominent ISP at the time was called Surf South, S U R F mm-hmm. South, and uh, boy, they had tons of customers. And uh, but yeah, I mean, and I remember some of the early versions of Microsoft's website. <laughs> you know, when they finally figured out that this internet thing was something that they probably should really pay attention to, their first website was running on a server up under someone's desk, up under someone's <laughs> desk at Microsoft. I did not know that. Yeah, the dude would actually, I think, ac- accidentally kick it from time to time and knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's true or not. I've heard that, but yeah. I mean, now, you know, all their stuff runs in huge data centers, but to think that the very first version of, of Microsoft.com was running on a single server sitting under somebody's desk at the Microsoft <laughs> offices. Humble beginnings. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, just like us. Couple of years, we become you know mega media powerhouses. <laughs> From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> there you go. Okay, next to the last story, we've got this uh, longtime Iowa farm cartoonist was fired after creating this particular cartoon. Now, for video viewers, I've got it up here. Um, so to describe it, basically, you've got these two farmers standing at a barbed wire fence. And one is talking to the other. The first guy says, I wish there was more profit in farming. And the other guy responds, there is. In year 2015, the CEOs of Monsanto, DuPont, Pioneer, and John Deere combined made more money than 2,129 Iowa farmers. (laughs) I can't imagine why the guy got fired. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. (laughs) So I wish I, I wish I had the no agenda soundboard. I'd play the exact response I'm thinking right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the cartoonist in question, his name is uh, Rick Friday, and he has been doing uh, this cartoon uh, every Friday for over two decades, about 21 years. So he made a he made a Facebook post about it, uh, and I'm gonna read it. It says, uh, "Quote again, I fall hard." In the best interest of large corporations, I am no longer the editorial cartoonist for Farm News due to the attached cartoon, which was published yesterday. Apparently, a large company affiliated with one of the corporations mentioned in the cartoon was insulted, canceled their advertisement with the paper, thus resulting in the reprimand of my editor and cancellation of its Friday cartoons after 21 years of service in over 1,090 published cartoons to over 24,000 households per week in 33 counties of Iowa. And this is why I've opened a Patreon instead of trying to find sponsors. This right here. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's the same reason why No Agenda does what they do. They, they're they completely the whole value-for-value value model they will not accept advertising because as soon as you start taking advertising, you've got to you're beholden to the advertisers. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm reminded of I'm reminded of something that Tom Likas talked about one time. And, and those that don't know Tom Likas, he's an old shock jock, very misogynist dickhead. But <laughs> uh, you know, he is Fair. what he, he is. What he is. <laughs> but he was talking about when when he was in radio, he made some. Uh, I think it was Sprite or somebody had come out with uh, a new flavor or whatever. And he, he made some, he, he basically tried it. And he made some derogatory remarks about the fact that it wasn't really all that good. Well, mm-hmm. it wasn't that company that actually got upset about it. It was another company that got upset about it, contacted the radio station and said, look, he can't be talking about, you know, Sprite or 7-Up or whoever it was. And the reason for that was because... Their drinks sat right next to 7-Up or Sprite or whoever it was on the truck yeah, and in the stores. <laughs> so they didn't want to be associated with the, the negativity that Lycus was bringing toward that particular brand because it could rub off on their brand. Mm. And he could not believe 
that he was basically being told, you can't say anything negative about this company's drink because this company over here doesn't want to be a, inadvertently associated with it. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right to do the Patreon thing. Um, yeah. The only downside is sometimes advertisers, you wind up making more money, but, you know, there again, if you want to be free and clear, you got to go with the non-advertising model and hope that people will see value in what you're doing. Just like with No Agenda, just like with Tom Merritt, uh, mm. you know, I think even I think even Scott Johnson with Frog Pants, he doesn't do any advertising anymore, does he? Uh, he does some ads for, like, TMS and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. no, he doesn't really do a lot of advertisements. I think he's still got codes with people like Doghouse Systems and stuff, right. but otherwise. Because, yeah. you know, for the longest time, and Twit still does this, but you have, you know, the Audibles, the Square Spaces, and all of those guys. Yeah. I mean, Andrew Zarian with GFQ still does advertising. Yeah. But they also do Patreon. Mm. Go figure. So, <laughs> you know, I guess what, whatever you can do. And, and not saying anything negative about what Andrew's doing. I think what he's doing is great, but uh, with him still doing advertising, he he still has to mo to watch his P's and Q's when it comes to what he says in these in his recordings. Right. But yeah, like this guy, and hopefully, you know, if the people in these thirty three counties, we're talking twenty four thousand households, you know, if they hear about this, hopefully they'll rise up. And, and actually give the editor of this newspaper a, a piece of their mind. Mm. Because the guy or, pointed... Go ahead. There's, there's, there's another way that this could go, too. What if he went independent and started doing, like, his own strip online or something he like that? He could do that and, and support it. And create so. his own Patreon to, to have people support it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Because he, he did not report erroneous information in his cartoon. He said... Um, he said he actually looked it up, and this is real information that he got. Yeah. So. Just someone didn't like the real <laughs> the real information getting out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, it says, uh, his editor said a seed dealer pulled their advertisements with Farm <laughs> News as a result of the cartoon, and others working at the paper disagreed with the jokes made about the agricultural corporations. Quote from Friday, <laughs> When it comes to altering someone's opinion or someone's voice for the purpose of wealth, I have a problem with that. It's our constitutional right to free speech and our constitutional right to free press. A seed company, huh? I wonder who out of that list of people could possibly be the seed company that they're talking about. <laughs> Let's see. Um, uh, John Deere makes tractors and other farm equipment. DuPont... Mm, Last thing, you know, they make some chemicals. Um, I don't know. Monsanto? Maybe. <laughs> it's not like they make soybeans and have a patent. And yeah, they can yeah. go die in a fire as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I hate that company. They probably can't die in a fire because they probably genetically engineered it to where they can't. That's <laughs> oh god! Every uh, now the seeds have fire suppression mechanisms in them. Oh my goodness! <laughs> right. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, some of the some of the comments are very telling, and and they they seem to support him. And of course, you know the standard Orwellian quote: "In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act." So, ah, government waste. Mm. Okay, this one just got me. Yeah, this will be a bit fun. I, fig I figured we could end it off with something pretty fun to just take a look at. <laughs> okay. So, Senator Jeff Flake, a Republican of Arizona, has released... He's heard all the jokes. We're not going to make any of them. <laughs> Yeah, because they're all flaky. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> God. That's terrible. All right. Yep. So, a new survey of questionable spending was released by Senator Jeff Flake, Republican of Arizona, and it's called the 20 Questions Government Studies That Will Leave You Scratching Your Head. And it highlights a selection of wasteful taxpayer-funded studies 
that cost a total of $35 million. And this PDF, it is beautiful. It's It's got to be the most entertaining government document I have ever looked at in my life. It's just beautiful. <laughs> I, I know. Uh, the you cover know, alone is just... <laughs> yeah. It's... Uh, it's not your typical drab government document. That's, I mean, there's, for audio listeners, it, it's, it says 20 questions at the time. I mean, there's a picture of dinosaurs. There's a picture of goldfish, uh, drunk birds. Um, the, uh, oh God, what do you call that? The, the dude in the center. It's supposed to be like the something man. Uh, I know. I yeah. can't say it either. I want to. It's, it's a Da Vinci painting. I find. Yeah, it's the one where the man's standing there, but he's got like multiple legs out, multiple arms out. But this one's, you know, got a guitar. Mm-hmm. We got the monkeys. Yeah, I mean, it it does not look like something that the government would actually make. You want to you want to go through all of these studies that he found here back and forth just to let just let people know this stuff that he found. Uh, are they in the PDF or just from the article? They're they're in the PDF. They're, they're, the second page actually has a what's all in this sort of thing. Yeah, I was looking at that. Um, let's see. Profiles in federally funded science. Uh, introduction. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where does it hurt the most to be stung by a bee? That one was one. a a million dollars. Yeah. Um why does walking with coffee cause it to spill? A hundred and seventy two thousand dollars. <laughs> Do Republicans and Democrats look different? Fifty thousand dollars. Apparently that was whether or not people are more feminine or not in another thing. I, I heard some of these this morning because this is whenever I found it up. I put this in here like last minute. Um, do drunk birds slur when they sing? That was $5 million to find that out. <laughs> You're going to love this next one. <laughs> $3.5 million. Why does the face of Jesus appear on toast? <laughs> oh, you know what? I would have done that study for one point five million. Yeah, <laughs> give us give us la- some of that money would be used to buy me and you lab coats, and we'll do the study properly. That's we're, right. We've that, got people on both sides of the spectrum. That way, we're not biased. That way, we'll <laughs> we'll get to the bottom of this. <laughs> oh God! You know, as a side note, this reminds me. If you haven't seen the latest uh, John Oliver show from um, this past Sunday, it's mm-hmm. about the main focus is about studies. You need to watch yeah. it. It is hilarious. I will, I'm planning to. I saw that he was about that. I went, oh, my favorite topic. Because, yeah, you you know me in studies. That's another reason why this just tickled me when I saw this. Um, are Republicans or Democrats more disgusted by eating worms? They paid $155,000 to find this out. Um, how many shakes does it take for a wet <laughs> dog to dry off? $390,000. Our cheery... Are cheerleaders more attractive in a squad? $1.1 $1. million to find this out. <gasps> what type of music do monkeys and chimps like? Thir- $13 million? Well, you got to pay the artist. <laughs> oh, God. Um, could you outrun a dinosaur? $1.9 million, because, of course, they secretly have government time travel programs, so they needed to know this. <clears throat> of course. <laughs> Who will be America's next top model? $2.9 million. We find that out on a stupid reality show every... Anyway. <laughs> um, I was going to say, yeah. Are, champi- are chimpanzees better gamers than humans? $340 million. Or $340,000, spoiler alert, they're actually more polite than most humans you play in multiplayer <laughs> games. So just... <laughs> I was going to say they're probably better than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so a million dollars to find out why is yawning is contagious. <laughs> is Facebook addictive? $511,860 to find this out. That's 
it's it's a weird number that that 860 was at the end of it. Right? I know why that uh, is being liberal a choice or genetic. Two point six million dollars. Come on, I mean, what's next? Is gay a choice or genetic? I mean, <laughs> wow. Okay. What are the what are the most popular emoticons used by college students in text messages? Five hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars just to find this out. I can tell you which one. This one, the bird. <laughs> Jesus. That and the little poop emoji with the eyes and the smile. Those those are the. <laughs> Which has more hairs, a squirrel or a bumblebee? $753,000. How long does it take to pee like a racehorse? <laughs> well, if you give me a couple of cans of America. <laughs> $331,000 just to find that out. That was probably to buy all those cans of America. That's right. Oh, God. <laughs> Three point nine million. What makes goldfish feel sexy? <laughs> and then, fi- and then finally, and then, and then we hear Schaefer in the corner have his drummer do the drumming thing for the final one. Number twenty. Does cocaine make honeybees dance? Two hundred forty-three thousand dollars. And that's been our top twenty, everybody. <laughs> This this hurts me. This is so bad. This hurts me. I had a feeling it might. <laughs> oh. But this was such a terrific find. Was this on T- yeah. was this on TMS this morning or what? Oh yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I have to dive in a little bit on this one that deals with the whole pain. Mm-hmm. Uh this guy. This is the Million Dollar National Science Foundation grant to Cornell University. Michael Smith had a bee sting him roughly 200 times on 25 parts of his body and then rated how much it hurt. Guess what one of them was? His penis. (laughs) Yep. Not only that, but his scrotum as well. He's got a rating. He says the study found that being stung on the penis, which was a pain rating of 7.3, Hurt more than being stung on the scrotum at 7.0 or nipple at 6.7, but God. less than being stung on the upper lip at 8.7 or the nostril at 9.0. Wow. <sighs> well, that's the fleecing of America, folks, right there. Yep. <laughs> it's this kind of crap that gets ducktailed into. All of your are are dovetailed, yeah, dovetailed into your bills. It's like, well, I'll support your bill if you will fund this research over here where I got this professor friend of mine, and he wants to know how it feels to be stung on the penis by a bee. He's got some. He's got some very eclectic taste, but we'd like to fund it for him. We'd really <laughs> like to fund that for him, and I will go along with your bill if you put this in there. Yeah. Oh, I think they just all need to die. <laughs> That's it. The this is the petri dish. The experiment is a failure. It is over. Time. To, somebody turn off the lights. We're going home. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we're done. We're just- not everybody. Yep. Yes. It's been a good show. See you. <clears throat> All right. Well, I guess that's going to wrap it up. That's the last story, and we're actually running a little. Well, we we had a technical difficulty right in the middle of the show. So anyway. Yeah. You know, I'm going to work my, my magic, and hopefully you won't even know except the fact that I've already told you. I pulled back the fourth wall. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Sam, you got anything you want to plug, talk about? Get anything just, coming up? Just that, as usual, you can find me at about.me slash labtech7 for all my social media links, and all of my other podcasting can be found at tscn.tv. Just, just tscn.tv. I don't know why I went for a slash there. I wasn't saying anything specific. Because so. you want them to go to uh, slash support so they can support your Patreon. That's what you're at. There. That, that'll do it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 
All right, my social media stuff can be found at about.me slash GD Adkisson and all of the podcasts. Uh, this show and uh, Tech Slant and everything else that uh, I do and we do uh, together is over there at slant.fm. And if you have any feedback, the email address is feedback at slant.fm. And if you want to leave a voicemail, the number is 313-718-2557. And yes, it is totally different than the call-in number. So remember, we record this show live each Monday and Wednesday at 2 p.m. That is if the internet will actually stay up <laughs> so that we can stream it live. So have a, yeah. So y'all have a great week, and we'll see you next Monday for another episode of What's... Take care. Bye-bye. show is a production of the Slant FM Digital Network. Find more at slant.fm.